we're going to get started now, okay? Um, hi, my name is Jane Gordon. I'm a jewelry designer and I'm here to show you Jane's super easy technique for stringing pearls. I, um, you know, all my jewelry is filled with symbolism about happiness and I finally realized there's something intrinsically satisfying about making your own jewelry. If you think about it, every people in every corner of time and history, every corner of the planet, um, makes their own jewelry. People run naked through the jungles and they still decorate their bodies for no functional reason whatsoever other than it just somehow resonates with us. So I realized making jewelry makes people happy and since that's what my work is about, I decided to teach it. And um, the classic technique of stringing pearls is very, very difficult. I'm going to show that to you very quickly here. Um, what you need to string pearls is uh, some kind of thread, and we'll talk about the different types later on. You need uh, some kind of a needle, something to actually put together, pearls or beads, gemstones, wood, whatever you want to use. Um, you'll need a clasp. I use French wire, and I will explain that to you later on. Uh, if you're me, you also need glasses and hearing aid batteries, um, lipstick, and some water. But that's maybe just me. Now, the classic technique, what you do is... Now, this is easier when there's better light. So I can find the hole in the pearl. Oh, goodness. Don't worry, where we have the table, there's uh, much better light. I cannot find the holes in these pearls. Ah, there we go. All right, classic technique, what we do is you put one pearl on the thread and then you tie a knot. To tie the knot, you just tie it, but then how do you get this knot so it's very, very close to the next pearl? Well, what you do is you take a little tweezer and you put the tweezer on the thread right next to the pearl. You pull the knot tight. If it doesn't go tight enough, then you separate these threads and give it a little tug and, and then you do the next one. It's extremely cumbersome and it's difficult to, it's difficult to learn. If you do a whole strand and you've got, I did once, uh, it was my first or second year, I, I had strung a, it was about like, 48 inches of pearls for a lariat. And um, there was one place in about the center that had maybe a 16th of an inch that was an extra. And as much as I wanted to ignore it, it just looked terrible. So I had to take the whole thing apart, take cut, uh, cut in between every little pearl, do this, what I'm doing here. Is there any way we can get more lights um, I had to, oh my God, this is crazy. Pardon? Yeah, it's just really, I'm having, really having trouble finding the holes in these. Um, hi, we tried waiting. <laughs> uh, and you've got it, so you've got to tug all the little threads out. I, I, can't, I just can't see. Um, all right, and you got to start over. So what I'm going to do here while I'm searching for the, for the holes is give you a little talk about the materials. People often ask, pardon? The, the needle is, uh, you asked about what kind of needle to use? The needle that you use for threading, this is called a flex needle. It's not really a needle. It's a piece of twisted wire. And if you see, I can poke myself right in the face with it, and it just bends. It's got a very, very large eye, so it's very easy to get the thread into the needle. And because it's so soft, as soon as you um, put the needle, as soon as you put the needle through the very first pearl, the hole just collapses down, and then you just string the rest of your pearls. People ask a lot whether or not they're reusable. I suppose you can, but every time you try to reuse it, you're going to just stress out the needle a little bit. And you don't want it to break in the middle of a strand. They aren't particularly expensive, so I would just, I would just say go ahead and use a fresh one every time. 
Um, so now, as I said, I, I didn't like the technique, the classic technique that people always use, stringing pearls. It takes years to learn to do well. And it hurt my, my neck and my back when I'd be sitting hunched over the bead board. I would, it was just really uncomfortable. So I developed a way of stringing that's really easy. It's really easy. I didn't do, develop it for teaching. I just developed it because I like to sit back, put my feet up. I can even walk around and, and talk on the phone as long as I have a, a headphone in. Um, I can watch movies. I just stretch myself out. And I do Jane's super easy, perfect technique for stringing. And when I got on the ship and started teaching classes, I realized that I can teach you in, in one, one class. I can teach you how to do it. And it's really exciting because if you imagine, if I, if I put a canvas and a palette of paint, paint in your hand, and I told you, you're going to be able to paint anything in your imagination, and you don't have to worry about technique, and you don't have to worry about learning. Just think of an image, and it's going to go out of your hands onto the canvas. That's what you're going to be able to do with pearls and gemstones. And I'm going to also show you in the class how to scavenge around for things. And uh, practically everything looks more beautiful when you mix it with pearls. I have, um, I have one little pendant upstairs that I can show you. It was a pen that broke, and I was looking at the little spring that came out of the pen, and I realized if I find a pearl that fits in it, which was not difficult to do, it makes a really cute little pendant, and I'll show you how to do that also. Um, so you've got the materials, you have a flex needle, and you've got thread. There is no, you have a question? What was the question? Where would you buy the materials is the question. Uh, you buy them. Um, findings is anything in jewelry that isn't the jewelry itself. It's called a finding. So if you Google findings, then you can pretty much get what you need. People talk about, I've never been there, but there's a place called Michael's or Claire's. Um, I also have pearl stringing instructions for anybody who takes the class, and it has a list of getting started materials, sizes, and uh, you know, just said anything you might need to get started. There's an endless availability of new things to, so you can create new ideas, but it's a pretty good list. And I also give you my supplier in the list. Um, as I started to say, there's no perfect thread for stringing on. Um, does anybody here have pearls? Everybody has pearls. How, uh, who's had them restrung every maybe one or two years? Oh, naughty. Passengers. Um, how, who had them strung every five or ten years? Who had them restrung never? Who thinks they don't have to restring their pearls because they only wear them once or twice a year? Okay. <laughs> Let's imagine that you had a white silk shirt. This is what we're stringing on, white silk. And you wore it once or twice a year and didn't clean it and put it back in the closet and imagine around the neck and the cuffs where bacteria from your perspiration, it might just be a little bit, some skin cells, all that stuff gets in there. The bacteria multiplies. Did you ever put a shirt in and you think it's clean and you take it out later and it's a little smelly? This is what's happening to the thread inside of your pearls. It's nasty. Silk thread sits beautifully. It's very strong when it's fresh and new but it needs to be restrung every couple of years. Synthet synthetic thread doesn't break as easily, but it stretches more easily, and it doesn't sit as nicely on your neck. You can use a high-tech wire that neither stretches nor breaks, but you can't knot it, and it really doesn't sit as elegantly, unless you're using gemstones. Um, if you're using gemstones, they'll often cut the thread, and for my work, because all of my customers don't know how to restring, I'll use high-tech wire when I mix gemstones with pearls. But for you, use the silk. If it breaks, you know how to redo it, or you will after you take my class. So we definitely want to restring our pearls every year or two. I, before I was in the business, I was in a taxi cab wearing my mother's pearls that I borrowed from her, and they broke, and I always assumed I had gotten them caught on something. And I, I thought I'd picked up all the pieces. I had them restrung. I gave them back to my mom. She couldn't get them around her neck. 
And I couldn't under, I never really thought about it, but I, I didn't know what happened. Some time ago, I was looking at some pearls in my collection. No one had ever worn them, but they looked tired. So I took them up, I took them to restring them. And while I was trying to cut them apart, they were falling apart in my hand. The thread had actually disintegrated. I don't know if it's from the salt air or just from sitting around on, you know, display forms, but it was, um, you know, it sort of explained what had happened to my mom's pearls. So restringing your pearls, people say, aren't I going to hurt them if I'm new at this and I don't know how? Even if you don't change the clasp or update the look or anything, just restringing them is going to make them look fresh and new. Handling them, the oils in your hands and your neck are very good for the pearls and the clean thread. It's going to be good for them. You cannot, you cannot hurt your pearls with thread and a flex needle. You're only going to take good care of them. Pardon? Do we, am I going to put the clasp on? Do you have faith in me? No, I'm going to show you how to do everything. I'm going to show you how to thread them, how to put the clasp, how to do all the knots, and how to finish it up. And then later on, if you want to learn how to make earrings, I'll show you how to make earrings, pendants. If you have an idea for something to make and I haven't made it before, I'll sit and figure it out with you. We're going to make a lot of different things here. But the first thing we're going to learn is the super easy stringing pearls technique. So. The key to my technique is the first thing I do is I put the entire strand on before I do anything else. Then I put a little piece of French wire, which you can't see from where you are. It comes in a bag like this. I cut it into small pieces. I thread it onto the thread. And um, it's like a tiny, tiny little slinky. What it's going to do is wrap around the clasp and protect the clasp from rubbing directly on the thread because that's the place the pearls are most likely to break first. This way, it's going through the little slinky. On top of that, it looks very elegant. It's got a really nice finish as if you soldered a little ring onto it. The next thing I'm going to do is put the clasp. Now I'm going to bring the first pearl and the French wire and the clasp just about to the middle of the thread. And I'm going to go around the French wire through the first pearl. Now, if I can do this with my bad eyesight in the dark, I think anybody can do it. And I pull this back. Okay. Now, watch how easy this is to tie a knot. Boom. So it's just, and then all you do is you sit back, you relax, put your feet up. I have uh, special bifocals that are really strong for looking at the pearls, and then I can look up and watch movies on TV while I'm doing it. And there you go. Because we're not doing just one side, because we've got two, instead of having to lean over the beadboard, it's just like tying a shoe. And I've taught this so many times that there are um, certain places that I see people um, kind of go awry. There's no right and wrong in creating art, but I can tell you there's certain things that will make it more difficult to do the whole thing without tangling the thread. And I can head you off at the past because I've seen so many people learn. I taught a lady with glaucoma who is going in for cataract surgery the day after the cruise. I taught a woman with Parkinson's. I taught a woman with arthritis whose husband kept coming around saying, you have arthritis, you can't do this. We kept shooing him away and she did fine. I taught uh, one woman who her local bead shop told her she was unteachable, which I f was mortified because anyone who wants to learn is teachable. I taught one woman came to me and she only had one arm. She asked me if I could teach her to string pearls. And I thought about this motion of stringing pearls. And I said, I'll give it a shot. And guess what? She did great, actually. She learned a lot faster than some of the other people with one arm. And, uh, and on the last ship, I taught a three-year-old. <laughs> OK, I had her attention. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> well, 
I'm not so sure. The three-year-old, actually, her mom said I kept her riveted for 20 minutes, which apparently is a long time for a three-year-old. <laughs> but uh, I have pictures. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of men have been taking the class because it gives them something to teach their granddaughters. And what it's really nice because not only does it give you something to teach them, but once you get going and you get into the rhythm of it all, that's when conversation starts. It's very relaxing. You can talk about anything because you're not really directly focused on the thing. You're focused on the art and creativity. And it's a really nice way not only to you know, get in touch with your children and grandchildren, but really get them to open up and, you know. So uh, we, it was great on the last ship. We had two big, giant guys. They were like six foot four each with giant muscles and big, giant fingers. And one was a cop and one was an emergency worker. And uh, they were great. They, were, they loved it. They were there the whole time making stuff for their wives. So we're just moving along here. One at a time. Yes, I put them all. I put the whole string. Well, I told you a little fib just for convenience for me. Um, so I'm going to clear that up now. I put almost the entire strand on the thread. And as you see, it's very relaxed to just move along, stringing them one at a time, putting a knot between each one. When you get to the last one, you don't do a knot yet. We're going to do one later. Have faith in me. Now we're going to put the last couple of pearls on, if I can find the holes in the dark. Seriously, if I can do this with my bad eyes in the dark, I don't want to hear one complaint about your eyesight. Was there a question? I taught myself. I learned, I went to a, a pearl stringing class at Gemological Institute, which by the way, cost me $650. Um, and uh, so I went to a class, and they taught me the way I showed you at first, the real difficult way. And I did it that way for a while, but as I said, I just didn't like it. So I taught myself this easier way. I don't follow instructions very well, so I'm kind of used to teaching myself things. I put the last few pearls on. Now, if you've done a whole necklace, and let's say you're doing a pattern, one of the advantages of putting the whole necklace on before you do the knots is you can see if the length is right. You can see if you like the look of it. Sometimes I'll put the whole thing on the thread and realize that I need maybe two little rondelles in the center to set a centerpiece off or two tiny pearls or something that, that sets it apart. And it's so much easier to take these off before you do all the knots than if you've done the whole necklace and then you realize that you've made a mistake. At this point on the end, I tell people three pearls, but you have to remember, I'm an artist, I don't care about numbers. By three, I mean two, five, seven, ten, whatever you want to do. You might realize it's too short, too long, and you can change it around here. So I put the last several on, I'm going to right now. I've got the French wire. Now I'm going to take the other side of my clasp. Okay. I'm going to put this through. And now I'm going to go back through the first pearl. Bringing the clasp, bringing the French wire. There is me. And we just bring this up into place. The French wire has now wrapped around the other side of the clasp. And now I'm just going to tie a knot in between these first two pearls. And now, however many you have, if you have three, five, whatever number you have, you just work backwards until, I will show you in a moment, what's going to happen is the very beginning of your thread is going to be right next to the very end of your thread. And uh, I cannot see a thing here. Are there any questions so far? There we go. See, the beginning of the thread is right next to the end of the thread. All you do is tie a knot. Uh, I do a double knot here, or I'll show you how to do a surgeon's knot. 
you take, I don't have my glue with me, but you take a very, very high-tech glue. It's called clear nail polish. You put it a little dab on the thread, rub it into the thread, rub it off of the pearls, clip the thread. Do not clip the thread so close that you clip the whole th thing in half. As many times as I say that, I do it from time to time. And then you have your necklace. And I'll pass this around so you can look very closely. You'll see the French wire. I use gold color French wire on a silver color clasp so that you can see the difference. And you can have a look at this right at the beginning and the end. You don't have to worry if you, if you uh, don't remember every detail, because I'll show you again when we do the class. Um, does, does anyone have any questions? Um, yes, the French wire comes in a pack. It comes in one long string. And what I do is I cut it in tiny little segments. And then you, you use that to wrap around the clasp. And, and I'll, I'll explain to you when you do the class about all the different sizes and the colors and the materials. The French wire, um, she asked, what is the French wire? French wire is a little piece of metal, like a tiny slinky that goes over the thread and wraps around the clasp in the beginning and the end of the necklace. And it protects the thread from the place where it rubs on the metal of the clasp, because that's the place it's likely to break first. It also gives a more elegant, finished look. And it's, it's just a, a nicer way of doing than a bead cap. Does anybody want an overview of pearls in general? I, I get a lot of questions about pearls. Uh, do you guys have a few minutes? Pardon? Okay. Um, originally, everybody knows where a pearl comes from. Uh, some kind of irritant floats inside the mollusk, and in order to protect its soft little body, it squirts the white material, which we know as a pearl. That material is called nacre. The nacre is actually what the oyster uses to grow its shell. It starts as a little baby tiny oyster, and it's always squirting nacre on the inside of the shell to make itself bigger, which is why when you look at clams, it looks like it's got rings, sort of the way a tree grows with, with rings. So the nacre it squirts on this little irritant, and it makes a pearl. And you can imagine how difficult it was and why pearls were so rare and cherished. Picture, before we had diving apparatus, people had to go down, hold their breath, um, some people could miraculously develop a lung capacity for maybe two minutes or three minutes, but that's max. And then you go in and you, and you go looking in the oyster beds and uh, opening them up. And then imagine before you had um, telephones and airplanes and internet faxes uh, that you're trying to match these pearls that you drove for and make a whole strand of perfectly matched pearls. It would be near impossible, which is why your grandmother's pearls were most likely graduated in size. You could maybe match two, 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 but each individual pearl farmer, maybe he could, pearl diver, he could maybe meet with another one in a nearby town, but it, it was not far reaching. Pearls were very rare and cherished and valuable. Eventually, around 1900, Mikimoto got the idea that maybe we could farm pearls. We could shove something inside the mollusk and get the pearl that way. And these, um, everybody at first was laughing, and they said they were not real pearls. They were fake pearls. And um, the, eventually, the terms came up cultured versus natural. And those are still accepted terms in the industry, but I find them very misleading. Um, does anybody here know anyone that had in vitro fertilization? Does anyone? Well, you can imagine um, if you, your child had in vitro and you have a grandchild that was produced that way, that the grandchild is not a synthetic child. And it is not somehow less valuable than a child who was born as a result of a night of drunken debauchery. Likewise, the cultured pearls are absolutely every bit as valuable as pearls that are found randomly in the ocean, which are called natural pearls. But somehow the word natural implies that the others are unnatural. And if you don't believe me that they're worth absolutely the same thing, 
uh, there is no more pearl divers. There's no more pearl diving industry. And if they were worth more, people would still be holding their breath and diving or making it easier using scuba diving equipment. The only place I've ever, ever heard of anyone having pearls that were found randomly is when someone says to me, I found this pearl in my dinner in a restaurant last night. Where, what should I do with it? So we're going to put that to bed. Cultured pearls, pearls found randomly, also known as natural pearls, same value. Um, the pearls, we're going to forget about the idea of better and best and worst, but I am going to help you understand what gives pearls their cost. The most expensive pearl would be a very, very large, deep golden, perfectly round South Sea pearl. Um, if someone gave me a strand, I'd be thrilled because they're expensive and I would try to sell them, but I would not wear them because I look horrible in yellow. And I don't particularly like the way my kind of bony shoulders look with giant round things on them. So they're the best in terms of cost, but they're certainly not the best for me. So we're going to forget about better, best, worst. The most expensive pearls are South Sea pearls, then Tahitian, then the Japanese Akoya pearls, then Chinese pearls. And there's a couple of reasons for that, and I'm also going to tell you the difference in the look. The South Sea pearls are either pale yellow to deep golden or a very silvery white. It's a kind of a different white than uh, the other pearls, the other white pearls you'll see. Um, the Tahitian pearls are known as black pearls, and they're various shades of gray. And the shades can be teal, yellow, pink, they, lots and lots of shades, but they're all grayish with these different over and undertones. They come from what's called a black-lipped oyster, but I do not know if the lips make the pearls black or if the same thing that makes the lips black makes the pearls black. I don't know. Um, the, in the South Sea pearls and the uh, Tahitian pearls, they can only put one nucleus, one irritant per mollusk. In the Japanese pearls, they can put about seven per mollusk. The Chinese pearls, they can grow about 50 per mollusk. Not only are they growing more per mollusk, but they grow them faster. They, it, it may be what takes the Japanese seven years to make. The Chinese can make the same size in like three years or a year and a half. So they're also using a tiny, tiny nucleus rather than a large bead. So the Chinese pearls are they're hardier, they're thicker. If you're, not, if you're using them for a bracelet and they're going to knock around, you, the Chinese pearls I find more functional. They're growing more, they're growing them quicker. Now the Japanese are the Akoya pearls that your grandmother probably had. The Chinese, I don't know exactly when they started farming pearls. At first they looked like Rice Krispies. You guys rem remember those? And everybody kind of laughed and thought they were fun. They had the beauty of pearls. They reflect off everybody's skin. Pearls make everyone look healthier. If you're very, very, very white, they bring out the rosiness in your face. If you're tan, anything white against tan looks great. Um, pearls look beautiful in everyone, but people said, well, the Chinese don't know how to make round pearls. Then the Chinese went ahead and they made round pearls. And everyone said, the Chinese don't know how to make shiny pearls. And then they made round shiny pearls. And even when I came into the business about um, 2001, people were telling me, well, the Chinese don't know how to make big round shiny pearls. And guess what? Now they can make big round shiny pearls. Chinese can make everything. Watch out. Chinese are making everything. So when you come up to my class, I can break everybody down in smaller groups. And everyone's heard the concepts that the thing that gives pearls their cost is the size, the shape, the luster, the surface area, and when you get to a whole strand, also the matching. But those are just concepts. It's like I can show you a glass of Coke and a glass of Dr. Pepper, and I can describe to you all day long the difference in the taste. But until you actually taste them, you won't really get it. But the second you taste them, you say, OK, I know, and you'll know forever. So what I'm going to do is every sea day at 10 and 3, I'm going to lay out hundreds of strands of pearls. And I'm going to, if you give me a half an hour of your time, I will pass the pearls around, put them in your hands, and show you group by group what you're looking for when you're in a pearl store, when you're buying pearls, and what gives them the different price. And then you can decide yourself where the trade-off is. If you have um, someone who's watching your house or watering your plants or feeding your cat, 
it's a lovely gift to give them a strand of pearls. You can buy some for $50, $60, $70. Maybe you notice that this person likes to wear blue a lot. You could put one blue bead in the center. And you've not only given them something that you made, but you've actually said, hey, I took my time to think about you and understand what you would like, and I've made this just for you. It's a lovely gift. It's nicer than saying, I found this on a table outside the ship somewhere. Um, Nobody's going to look at them and roll them around and say, mm, these aren't really perfect enough. If you have, you know, if you don't have a kid going into college that you're trying to figure out how to pay for and you can afford them, you might want to treat yourself to one perfect, perfect strand of small round pearls. It's sort of like seeing a woman in a Chanel suit. You don't know it's a Chanel suit or, or how many stitches per inches the seam have, how far the seams are turned out, if the lining is sewn or glued, or the fabric cut on the bias or the thread count. You don't know all those things, but the woman just looks like such an elegant woman. And that's what a perfect, perfect strand of pearls does. Me, personally, I like the most unusual shape of pearls. You can see the earrings and the necklace I'm wearing. Um, I just love these that everyone is individual. Some people call them misshapen or malformed, but I think they're perfect, just like people. I think the best people are covered with scars. Heaven knows I am. It gives us character and it gives us interest. Yes, these are absolutely, I have these for sale also. They're just completely natural formed pearls. Well, I mean, they're on a, on a farm, but they just come out all sorts of crazy shapes. Um, does anybody, we're going to have to close up pretty soon, but does anybody have any questions before we go? Um, well, I'll give you a price range of pearls that I have for sale and jewelry that I have, the jewelry that I have for sale. The jewelry that I have for sale ranges from uh, $20 to $20,000. And the pearls, the loose pearls that I have for sale, um, in, in my jewelry that I've made already, I work in 18 karat gold with diamonds, but I also work in silver and gold plate. And I, if anybody ever loves a design and they don't want to, they don't have the money or they don't want to spend the money, I'm happy to make it for you with uh, CZs or white sapphires instead of diamonds. You never have to worry about money with me. We'll, we'll find a way to make you happy. Likewise, the pearls that I have for sale range from about $50 a strand up to, I think, um, maybe 6000 for a strand. Um, what was the question? Can I... Oh, uh, yes. Um, you can take loose pearls in duty-free. Um, this is a kind of funny uh, edge here because um, if it's uh, my jewelry that I made is American Goods Returned and I sign an affidavit to that fact that you don't have to pay any duty. It doesn't go towards your $800. But now I'm bringing loose pearls and then you don't bring them into another country so it's not made in another country. They're made at sea in international territory by you, who is a person of your own country, and you bring them back to your own country. And I actually consulted a lawyer on whether or not there's duty to be paid on this, and he said, how would I know? And he's one of the top import-export lawyers in the country. So um, I think I see people waiting, and I think I have to wrap this up. My first class is at 3 o'clock. So if you guys want to learn more, did you have a quick question? Oh, um, outside the jewelry shop, uh, in between Mirabella and the main jewelry shop where I set up my display, you're going to see that I have a table set up. Or um, for those of you who are watching this at another time on another ship, just come to the jewelry store and ask. But j come to the jewelry store and they'll show you where. And at 3 o'clock, I'm going to show, show you, put the pearls in your hands, 10 and 3 every sea day, and then... Once you picked out which pearls you want to make, then you can just come and go as you want. And if it's not my regular hours, just let me know and I'll arrange to meet you there. And I have everything you could need. Pearls, gemstones, wood beads, clasp, earring things. I mean, everything you could want to make jewelry. Any more questions before we go? If you want to... Um, if, if you don't want to buy anything from me and you want to buy pearls somewhere else, then it's a $75 class fee. You may as well buy $75 worth of stuff. It's a better deal for you. Worse for me, but better for you.
Um, you, well, ch check with me later, okay? I'm having, because I think I'm getting the time to wrap up signal. So I'll see everybody at anywhere, the jewelry shop, 10, 3. Yeah, everything, come, come find me in the shop. 10 and 3 is when I do the presentation, and you can find me in the shop almost every waking hour. Okay, thank you so much.